It's that time again. It's the Football Hipsters podcast. The longest international break in recorded history is over and we're back to talk domestic football. Stay tuned. We're across it all. Hello and welcome to the Football Hipsters podcast. I am your host, Chris, and luckily enough, we are back talking club football again. As I say in the intro, it was seemingly the longest international break ever. Uh, I don't know whether that's because we're in England and we had lots of coverage of very boring English stuff, or whether it was just a really long interlull. I don't know what it was, but it didn't feel good. Nevertheless, though, I am joined tonight by Tom and by John. Uh, Good evening to you both. Good evening. Hola. Now, we have um, plenty to discuss, gentlemen, so we are going to rattle straight in uh, pretty quickly. But just to say a very quick announcement, Drew should be back, touch wood, next week. So for all of you fans of the Bundesliga, um, you've only got to put up with me and John uh, splicing our way through it for one more week. So um, good times ahead. (laughs) So stick with us. Right then, we will waste no time and get this week's show underway. And we're going to start in Spain with Tom. And it's this week's La Liga Roundup. OK, then, Tom, we're going to start with Legones and Sevilla. Now, uh, those people who follow Spanish football and indeed ourselves will know that Sevilla have been on a fairly lengthy run without an away win. Mm. That has changed. How long was it and how did they do it? Uh, well, their last w- uh, away win was on the 23rd of May 2015. Uh, so last season. Uh, and the, but the season before that um, was their last away win, and uh, it's been a rather long time since then until the weekend where they went to Leganes, the newly promoted side, and and came away with a fortunate three-two win. Um, they went two-nil up, and at that, well, at that point you're thinking, oh, this is on the way to a, to a, a severe away win. Luka Franco Vasquez scored, obviously the former Palermo player, and Samir Nasri got another goal on, on loan from Manchester City. Um, and then Leganes scored two goals in two minutes from Timor and Svanovski, and you're thinking, oh, okay, yeah, okay, we're back to, to normal routine. But it turned around the 85th minute that uh, Paolo Sarabia absolute brilliant goal from the left hand side runs across the right side of the box and curls uh, just on the left hand side of the box about 25 yards or so across the keeper and into the top right hand corner and the side netting it's that pit where it just sort of curls around the back of the net smoothly really really nice goal and uh, that, that got severe all three points and, and it's amazingly they and we'll go into a table later but I'll tell you now that they are still third and above Barcelona and a performance where you could see we've been saying for ages if there's going to be a team that is going to break into that top three again it probably would be severe but the only way they do that is by getting some away wins and now they have finally done it happy days happy days and um yeah it's, it's been the longest running thing ever i suppose you, you kind of thought it had to happen at some point and mm. uh, all records are there to be broken and that one has gone so well done to some paulis men moving on then to a basque derby mm. uh, bilbao athletic club whichever you prefer hosting sociedad another three two this time in favor of the home side was it uh, was it deserved on the day Yes, uh, yes, it was definitely deserved. Uh, Bilbao were, were the best club by far. Um, they didn't take the lead, though. Uh, Zuratutha uh, got in an early goal in the 16th minute for Real Sociedad. Uh, one of those ones where a corner comes across, no one deals with it, and he managed to get a foot on it and volley it into the goal, or half volley. Um, and, and that put them 1-0 up. But uh, and it, that lasted until the second half. Uh, they managed to hold on off, but then a uh, a 22-minute spell or so of, of athletic pressure broke through. Munayin scored a, actual, a similar goal to Sarabia's finish in the Sevilla game, uh, another curling effort from outside the box across the keeper to put the 1-0 up. Adarif then scored a fortunate goal where there was mix-up in the Sociedad box between the keeper, and all he had to do was simply dink it over Ruli and, and to make it 2-1 in the 60th minute. And then 12 minutes later, and Yaki Williams, one of our former hipsters' choices, was given an absolute sitter. Adarif puts it across, and it's... 
what's described in um, in FIFA terms as a Pez goal, where you simply pass it across and score in an open net. That's pretty much what it was uh, to make it three one. And uh, they got socially they got a consolation in the eighty third minute. And you go Martinez, who is someone who I have a big respect for, and I, I can see him moving on to better things in the future and possibly the new Sergio Ramos replacement eventually in the Spanish Spain squad. Um, so he got a, a got a goal in the eighty third uh, minute to make it three two, but it couldn't couldn't go any further than that, and it remained three two. But uh, Bill Bell on the up, uh, that's their fourth win in the last five matches. So uh, they they are doing well, and that will make uh, our friends at um, Athletic Club UK very happy. I'm sure mm, um, yes. they they do do a podcast, don't they? So um, they do indeed. Uh, the guy we interviewed, Rob Orty, and uh, another a Twitter account called Inside Athletic do it as well. So. There you go. So do look them up, people. I'm sure you can find the links. Um, certainly, if you if you haven't already listened, do listen to Tom's interview with those guys. It's a good family club and a good good chat that one. So definitely yeah. listen to that. Uh, right. Okay. We're going to sort of cheat and, and bend the rules a little bit and, and splice three into one here for, mm. for the um, the other game we want to highlight, which is basically the big three: Barca, Real Madrid, and Atletico. And we're clubbing them all together this week because they all had quite sizable victories. So um, who got what and where have they ended up? Yeah, they all got quite comfortable wins. Barcelona uh, beat Deportivo 4-0. Atletico Madrid beat Granada 7-1. I mean, that is a scoreline you'd never thought you'd see from Atletico side or Simeone side in particular. And Real Madrid came away uh, from the Real Betis uh, with a 6-1 win. Um, but I'll run you through them. It's basically all three games that were against the more poorer sides of the league. Deportivo, I think, have scored three goals all season. Something like that. Something ridiculous. Um, and Atletico Madrid have only conceded three goals all season so you can just see how it's going where they're just lacking goals and, and, and not being scored against with these teams Rafinha got a double Suarez and Messi scored Messi obviously coming back from injury in that game uh, Atletico Madrid Carrasco someone Chris you'll know very well from his days at Monaco got a hat trick Nico Gaetan great to see him getting on the, on the score sheet with a brace and how Correa another former hipster's choice and Thiago so a blast in the past with the seventh goal and uh, it was actually Granada opened the score in that game an absolute belter from Isaac Cuenca on the volley uh, but could get the points and they are really are destined for the drop already so early in the season and Real Madrid score as well Varane, Benzema, Marcelo, Isco Isco again so we got a brace and Ronaldo um, Ronaldo obviously celebrating his sixth goal as if he'd won the European trophy once again uh, even though he was already set at five goals up at the time uh, Sajudo scored a, a consolation when it was at 4-0 up for Real Madrid at the time to make it 4-1 in the 55th um, but yeah all teams pretty, pretty comfortable Atletico Madrid have now the best goal difference in the league and uh, that's certainly helped by the six goal margin they got against Granada. So it's going to be an interesting few matches coming up. I will indeed. I do. I do like Big Yannick uh, Ferrero Carrasco. I always <laughs> yeah. thought he's um, always thought he was underrated at Monaco, and uh, a few people sort of said, "Oh, he's not that great." And then he turned up and played our, our beloved Arsenal off the pitch, and um, yeah. people suddenly woke up to the fact he's quite good. So, good on him. Um, where, uh, where, where? Was I say where? What? Sorry, should, I should say where the other results from the uh, weekend's games. Yeah, so uh, Las Palmas drew nil nil of Espanyol. Not really sure if that's a great result for us or not. We just need a win, and we, it's not coming. Uh, in terms of our results, uh, Malaga drew one one with Deportivo Alaves. New probably slightly that way. Uh, Juanpi got sent off, and Hernandez got sent off. Both sides getting men sent off. Davison and Rosales. Rosales got an absolute screamer in that game. It has to be said. Uh, Sporting Gijon. Lost at home to Valencia 2-1. That's Prandelli's first win. Uh, Mario Suarez getting a double and Carlos Castro scoring a header for Gijon. And Villarreal won 5-0 against the Celta Vigo side that had just come off the back of a 4-3 win against Barcelona. Trigueros scored a late goal and it was preceded by goals from Vas, Bacambu and Roberto Soriano, a player that John will know much more about uh, with a brace before that. Sergio Gomez got sent off for Celta in that game late on. And uh, tonight's game, as we're recording on the Monday evening, uh, Ibar lost 2-3 at home to Osasuna. Uh, Roberto Torres, Sergio Leon getting a brace for Osasuna. And Sergio Enrique and Escalante scoring for Ibar. Games, games, games. All done and dusted. Where are we looking table-wise now then? Uh, yes, yeah, so at the top, as I said, is Atletico Madrid, 18 points and an 18-plus goal difference. Real Madrid a second, also 18 points with a 14-plus goal difference. Sevilla third with 17 points, 4-plus goal difference. Barcelona fourth, 16 points, 16-plus goal difference. And Villarreal are fifth with 16 points. At the bottom, Granada, two points, awful. 
Uh, Osasuna 19th, 6 points. There's a 4-point gap there already. Sporting Gijon on 18th with 7 points. Espanyol 17th, 7 points. And Real Betis 16th, 8 points. There you go. Like it. Concise. Have you got a game that you are particularly keeping an eye out for for the weekend's fixtures? Uh, I'm naturally keeping an eye out for the Espanyol Ibar because it's surely a game we can target to get points. But Valencia are playing Barcelona. Uh, which should be quite good, and uh, Real Madrid at home to Athletic Bilbao, so another great... And Athletic Madrid are away to Sevilla as well, so there's loads of games to watch. Ah, so there you go. So you're breaking the rules again. There's, there's plenty of games to see. <laughs> there's loads of big games to see. <laughs> there's there's lots, lots, to, uh, lots to take in, so I'm sure you'll be across those uh, as usual. Um, now, I'm going to I'm gonna slightly break the rules here, because here um, you, um, Tom, you have to leave us. Um, you're, you. you're sort of jumping in and, and jumping out like it's a, a, a quick in and out session, so to speak, not in that way of course we're uh, we're professionals at this podcast um but before you go i just wanted to ask you uh, a question we've had a really good question sent in from a gentleman that i think is a either a new listener or just fancy asking us a question i don't know um but uh, he asked us a question before the english breakfast or after the english breakfast pod last night and i think it's relevant to all of our leagues so i'm going to ask you before you go it comes from a guy called henker uh, who's at guna Hav. Or Harvey, I don't know how that's pronounced. Anyway, he said, "How would you describe the club's Twitter mobs?" Uh, and he says, <laughs> "Numbers and uh, I'm not going to use that word, but <laughs> a rude word, delusion, etc." So mm. I wanted to just ask you: in Spain, yeah, is is there what we experience in England as much with the sort of the, the Twitter fan base of the mm. clubs, and, and and what is it like with regards to sort of how fans conduct themselves against their clubs when they're doing well or, or not so well? Well, it's, it's, it's obviously it's a difficult question. It's not as easy to you think answering as an Arsenal fan or whatever you see all the time. But as a, as as a watcher of La Liga, I'm not massively involved with the social media. But what I've, what I've when I've spoken to other people, um, and obviously when I've had interviews with John Driscoll, and he speaks about obviously the questions that he gets asked uh, on his podcast, and he he said it was hilarious that. Um, when Rafa Benitez was the manager of Real Madrid, um, they used to get inundated beforehand with loads of Real Madrid fans asking questions, asking questions. But when he was the manager, they had no uh, questions coming in about Real Madrid. They just they just hated him. It didn't matter what he was doing. They just hated him. They, they weren't bothered about Real Madrid and whatever. They just wanted him gone. So it is the same way that you see like in Valencia with the what hankies out of the stadium. It is a, it's another area where they're very quick to turn on, on, on people at the club, whether it's a player or a manager, but in terms of how it compares to the English side, obviously I'm much more well-versed in the English side of, of, of Twitter and what, and whatnot, but they, the Spanish social media is still very quite quick. It's very judgmental. It's, it's probably what's known as what a football fan is like on Twitter in in a way i don't think we could detract much from that it's that's just how it is and a, a lot of fans have a pretty short temper for it yeah true that there you go then uh hank i hope the, hopefully that gives you a little bit of insight from maybe another league um i am planning to ask ross that question next week about the english media but i thought it's a good idea to to get a perspective from uh, another place so well, yeah. good good stuff like it uh just before you leave us and tom any other games to look out for because there's a lot of spanish involvement in the champions league and uh the europa league this week including a, a mammoth task for man city barcelona tie mm. um Real Madrid. Uh, Ligia Warsaw. Ligia Warsaw, there we go. Uh, Atletico. Oh, you've caught me there. I, I do apologise. Uh, they've played PSV and they've played Bayern Munich and they've got one more team and I can't remember who it is. <laughs> do you know, I can't remember who else is in that group. It's a smaller one. I yes, it is. Uh, I'm frantically I'm fran- googling. <laughs> I was going to say I'm frantically trying to find. This is what you call research, people. This yeah, is good. Right. I can tell you, Sevilla are away in Zagreb. While we do that, Rostov. Um, Real Madrid. Rostov. Ah. Let's go away at Rostov. There we go. There we go. We got there in the end. Um, and just to avoid any um, any any more sort of frantically scuttling around trying to find out who other teams are playing, the uh, Europa League. We've got Celta Vigo hosting Ajax. Uh, Villarreal away in uh, Osmanlispor is of Turkey. Um, Bilbao are away at Genk. Uh, that is the three teams so in the Europa League, isn't it? So. Yep. And did you mention Sevilla? Uh, yes, yeah, they're in Zagreb. Zagreb. Yeah. Yes, so uh, expect a good good return of points from those for most of, most of the teams going in those games. Yeah, after the big story of Rostov, you expect Atletico should win that reasonably comfortably. Um, I do expect Barcelona to beat Manchester City, Man City's form, and obviously Sevilla. Uh, oh, Real Madrid are going to beat Leisure Warsaw. That's pretty substandard. And uh, Sevilla should come away from Zagreb. But I'm saying that as an Arsenal fan, so you never know. 
Yeah, true that, true that. Okay, well, I'm sure we'll be across those games uh, on the satchel on Thursday, so we will do our best to to get through those sure, games sure. as well. Of but, Salzburg, um, of course. Oh, naturally, naturally, we always do. The Mighty Ninety might be retired, but we still keep track of our other teams. Playing don't we? Nice, I think, actually. Yes, I think they are. I think yeah, pretty... they're at home to Nice. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Should be a decent game, Matt. Should be a decent game. Anyway, right, we'll let you go then, Tom. Thank you very much okay, for your pleasure time. Pleasure as, as always. Usual. Enjoy and, the rest uh, of the show, guys. Thank you. And as, as usual, you can always tweet Tom with your questions. Um, he'll be happy to answer them in mm-hmm. uh, coming weeks. Thank you very much, Tom. No problem. See you later, guys. Thanking you. Right, John, let's do your section. Uh, let's see what's going on in Italy. And it's this week's Serie A Roundup. Okay, and then there were two. Right, John, let's start with Napoli Roma. Build as, well, build as exactly what it is, really. Two of the, the sides that are competing potentially with Juventus for the title. Napoli coming into the game in, in sort of fairly decent nick, but they lost um, Arcadius Milik, didn't they, during the international break? Yes. Do you think that's cost them because they didn't get the result they wanted in this one, did they? No, it was uh, Roma 3, Napoli 1. Um, also, I should say Napoli 1, Roma 3. Napoli were at home. So, yeah, the the derby di um, It's It was an interesting game because Napoli were probably the better team for large portions of it, but they didn't have uh, that killer finish, um, which obviously they were missing with Milik not in there. Um, Gaviadini took his place up front, played very well, but he's not a target man. He's not someone you can hit in the box with crosses. And when you've got players like Callihan, uh, Hamsik, Insignia, th- that's what they like to do, Is uh, especially those diagonal balls that Milik has really fed off and done surprisingly well uh, for how quickly he's adapted, at least to me anyway, not to Drew, as he keeps reminding me. Um, so they really missed him in the game. Um, in the end, it was Roma who got the win. Um, the first goal coming from uh, Edin Dzeko, who kind of undermined a little bit this season um, and he's consistently embarrassed me by scoring goals um, because I always make out how terrible he is and how he's so inconsistent and he's top of the goal scoring charts at the moment in Syria so uh, it was a mistake from Koulibaly at the back um, just didn't clear the ball out and Salah managed to pinch it and put a cross in and Dzeko got on the end of it he scored his second and um, at that point Roma looked fairly comfortable Uh, Spalletti used a very sort of strange formation it was three and a half at the back he was calling it um it was very weird Florenzi wasn't really defending was more higher up the pitch and De Rossi was sort of jumping between defence and midfield and the shape kept changing but tactics worked brilliantly um Koulibaly um did get a goal back for uh Napoli a uh, really good header from a corner um but it wasn't enough and late on Salah managed to get in behind Napoli who were pushing up very high to try and uh, get an equaliser at that point just sprung the trap and um, did what he does sort of 50% of the time which is put it away but once he's clean through you're just not going to catch him so really good result for Roma um, Napoli it's disappointing Sari obviously not very happy at all um, I'm not sure what they're going to do up front to be perfectly honest um, They there's talks of maybe trying to get Osvaldo or Didier Drogba's been mentioned and uh, Adebayor and all sorts. Closer uh, <laughs> as well, was it? Was it Closer? I think it was Closer they were talking about as well. Yes, Miroslav Closer, yes. So th- there's, <laughs> there's a long list of possible people coming in. Um, I'd be surprised, honestly, if any of those do. Um, like I said, Gabby Dean is a very good striker. He's just a very different type of player, so they might have to adjust their system slightly. But um, it's the first time Napoli have lost at home this season. First time Roma have won away in the league this season. Um, and first time that Napoli have lost two games in a row uh, under Sarri as well. So, uh, disappointing for them. Uh, good news for Roma. Um, and probably, to be honest, better news for Juventus more than anyone else. Mm. That's that's the thing, isn't it? Every time that a team takes points off each other or drops points and Juve win, you just sort of think the inevitable is, is going to happen all over again, don't you? So, yeah. Mm, yeah, tough one, tough one. I um, I, I did just want to just sort of ask you briefly on the uh, we're, we're going to come to this in, in a minute, actually. But the the situation with, with the, well, what we've kind of already mentioned, really, the situation with the strikers and whatnot. 
you, you've just said you don't know what they're really going to do. Can they sustain the situation as it is? I mean, do you, do you think that they've got enough going forward if, because uh, was it four months Milik's going to miss? It's something like uh, that, yeah, it's quite a while. I mean, if they don't get him, because I mean, I, you know me, I like I like Gabbiadini. Um, I think Callahan will get them goals. But mm. do you think that arguably they have to even change their whole style to to compensate for the loss? Um, I don't think they'll adjust it too much. They've they've shown before that they're adaptable, and they obviously they've not played Milik in certain games uh, in Europe and brought Gabbiadini in and still got results. The the issue is in the very big key games when they play a Roma, who uh, on the day were very were very good, or a Juventus, or uh, Milan, then they might struggle a little bit, because in those sort of games you have to take the chances you get, and they didn't take them today, and they still had other chances, um, you know, Insigne had some good chances, and Callihan as well, um, so on another day they might have maybe scored a few more, um, it's got to be said, both both goalkeepers were in particularly good form, uh, Chesney made some really good saves, so uh, I, th- I think the, the problem is in Serie A at the moment that Juventus just look even when they're not playing particularly well, they still get results. Whereas everyone else has to be on top 100% form the whole way through to really even be thinking about challenging them. So it's, it's a, it is a real shame because I think if Milik had stayed fit, then Napoli really could have pushed Juve this year. But um, with him being out that long, I, I think Juve are just going to end up sort of walking away with it sort of halfway through the season. Yeah, tough one, tough one. Still, at least on the plus side, I can use my CGI gag again with their strike force. <laughs> so, you know, with every cloud. Um, OK, let's move on to another game then before I get my horrible jokes out. Uh, Kiev won Milan 3, one of the few games I actually got to see this weekend because I've been away and busy and shooting around places. But um, yeah, good result is for Milan um, against a much improved Kiev side. They, they really have done well. But Montella is he's quietly getting something done uh with milan isn't he and, and they seem to be uh, i i don't know i don't know if i'm impressed or not do you know what i mean what what did you make of them overall um yeah we've we've spoken a few times about milan and how they you know they've they've got good goal scoring and they, they can create chances but defensively they haven't been the best and they've relied a lot on donnarumma um Okay, Kiev aren't going to offer the most threatening offence, uh, but they are they are a good team and they have improved this season. Um, and defensively, they do look more solid. Um, it's it's one of those awkward things. Montalivo, who obviously got a really bad injury, has been out for quite a while. Him being out of the team has allowed the young lad who we spoke about before, who got his uh, goal in his debut, Locatelli, to come in. And they made their midfield much more adventurous and exciting and only leaving Kuchka as the real defensive-minded player. And it seems to be paying off. Um, you know, Bonaventura and Locatelli, both players who like to run box-to-box, create chances and try and get goals. Um, they brought in Lapadula, who was their, not big money signing, but, you know, the signing that anyone in Syria knew because he was the top goal scorer in Serie B. Uh, it was only £9 million. Um, I say only nine million, but that's obviously not a lot of money these days. Uh, Suzo has been really good this season. Yang as well has come back from injury well, um, and yeah, they they're really starting to look like a team. And if you had said to me, you know, at the start of the season, old Milan will be uh, in the top three, at the, you know, okay, I know it's only eight games in. I would have I would have said no, no, you, you've got no chance. Montella's going to take some serious time to get these things sorted. But he really, really has got it working well. Um, Kuchka. Was his goal was absolutely amazing. I know you're a big fan of his. Um, just I am. Def- defensive error from from Kievo giving the ball away on the uh, edge of their box. But Kuchka still had a lot to do. He beat a man and absolutely levered it in the top corner. Um, still 25 yards out. Great goal. Um, and then Niang, um, who straight after half time probably would have been better, maybe um, putting a pass through. <laughs> Um, but uh, to Suso, but he didn't do it and took the shot on himself and scored another great goal going across Sorrentino, really good rocket. Um, Kiev did uh, get one back, but um, right in the last dying minutes, um, just to see things out, Carlos Bakker is attempting to claim the goal. Um, oh, he can't. He can't <laughs> claim that, I'm sorry. If, if you get a chance, it's worth looking it up. He, um, <laughs> he basically went for an outside-of-the-boot uh, shot, um, which was probably going for a throw-in. Because um, yes. he completely mishit it, but it came off uh, Daniele Di Chievo defender and went totally the other way, and Sorrentino had no chance. So, yeah, it was three one in the dying minutes, um, just to put any nerves that Milan might have had uh, to bed. But yeah, they, they really do look good, Milan, and it's the mixture of bringing in some of the youth 
um, with some of the players that have been there a lot longer. Um, you know, Abate's obviously been there a long time. You've got Paletta, who's an older defender. Romagnoli, who there is a lot expected of, even at such a young age. So, if he can keep it going, um, yeah, then there's there's a chance. He said, I can, I can, I think he said it was either I can smell or I can taste Europe, I think he was saying, which is kind of brave for a manager of Milan to say this early on in the season. But, yeah, they look like they can do it. If if not Champions League, then definitely Europa League. Um, it must also be said that uh, despite Montalivo's injury and some Milan fans, were, they weren't necessarily happy about it, but they were kind of, it's a weird blessing in disguise. Niang, when he scored his goal, he went over and got Montalivo's shirt and held it up to the crowd. So it was a goal for the captain, um, despite him being injured. So that was that was one nice thing to see. Yeah, it is uh, definitely, as you say, it's, it's a nice, nice touch that. And um, yeah, if Baka tries to claim that, um, well, <laughs> he celebrated like he claimed it. I was also quite annoyed because I needed one corner to win a considerable amount of money for that game. <laughs> and uh, when he got the deflection, I was like, oh, there's my corner. Happy days. And it ended up in the nest. I've never been so annoyed in all my life. Um, don't gamble, kids. We keep saying this. I never learn. Um, also, question, why does Kuchka have Kuko on his shirt now? Is that one of these silly it's nickname the, things? the nickname thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't, he, it's, he did have Kuchka before and then it changed. He did. And, yes, dropping back and forth. A, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the Delhi Alley theory, isn't it? The switching your name round thing. I'm not sure I understand, but still, they are footballers, right? Uh, final game. Um, sadly, so we have to get to it. Um, we we have we've dealt with one Milan. Let's deal with the other one. Uh, Internazionale, our, our beloved um, Nerazzurri. Hmm. Cagliari rocking up to to uh, San Siro, you, you fully expect Inter to get some sort of result. They get a penalty, uh, and a certain gentleman, which we'll come on to in a minute, misses it, and they go on to lose 2-1 at home despite taking the lead. Um, Handanovic uh, not having his best day either. Um, you can touch on the game if you like, but are we... Are we are we getting to crisis point now? I mean, Frank de Boer's been there, what, three, three and a bit months now? Um I don't know about you, that for me they they feel like they're going backwards at the moment. Yeah, it's not great. Um, we will get to why Mr. Riccardi might have missed his penalty in a minute, but yeah, the the game itself wasn't a great one to talk about. Um, Inter not playing fantastic, had a few chances, didn't take them. As you said, we got the penalty, um, which, to be frankly honest, we shouldn't really have uh, got a penalty for Bruno Alves. Um, I don't know even what it was for. It looked like he might have brushed Icardi's face, possibly with you know like a bit of his hair or something. And the uh, the official behind the goal, whatever they are now called, um, called for it sort of 20 seconds after play, after he was moaning about it. Uh, put the penalty wide. Um, Inter did take the lead, which I think might be the first time we've done that all season. Um, didn't come till the second half though, as usual. So some things do stick the same. Uh, Gio Mario getting his first goal for the club. Um, but then uh, a man by the name of Melchiori uh, got a goal back and um, basically Inter really did, just crumbled and you could see it in the players. Uh, the second goal went down as a Handanovic own goal, bit of a howler. Before Up to that point he'd made some really, really good saves um, and it was Melchiori again putting a cross in and it sort of skimmed off the post and was going to be loose in the six-yard box. Handanovic went for it and pumped it into the back of his own net so kind of ruined his really good day. Um the real story is Maro Icardi. He recently released a book. Well, I should say, sorry, before, before his book was released, yes, he has an autobiography out at the age of 23. I know, it's ridiculous. Um, he'd signed a brand new contract with Inter. Everything was happy. Um, yes, Inter season hadn't gone great, but they got their star player. He's being signed, and despite all the problems with FFP and everything else that's going on at the club, they've managed to keep hold of him. Yes, he has a release clause, but it's only for clubs outside Italy, so everyone was very happy with it. He then releases a... Uh, uh, autobiography and in it there is a, a page talking about a game in I think it's 2013 against Sampdoria where Inter lost 3-1 Icardi hadn't started the game he came on late scored a goal uh, Inter's only goal um, and they basically argued with the ultras at the end of the game now in in his book Icardi says that he took a sh- his shirt and shorts off and gave it to a young fan who was in the Curva Nord um, and then one of the old players uh, came over, took the shirt off of the young fan, threw it back at him, started abusing him. Icardi was throwing abuse back. Um, now, I do actually remember this game because it was only him and Guarin had gone over to the fans and they went to the cha- dressing room and then came back out again and spoke to them and it looked a little bit more calm. Um, but in his book, he claims that when he went to the dressing room in front of the directors of the club, 
Uh, he told them to record this and said that he basically insulted the fans back, said, I don't care how many of them are, there are, what is there, 10, 50, 100, uh, I come from the rough streets basically of Argentina, I will get criminals over from Argentina and um, if they come at me I will kill them, I don't care if they turn up at my house, and basically very stupid things to say. Um, the Ultras were not happy with this, obviously. Um, and said that he should be stripped of the captaincy. Uh, there was banners all over the curve of Nord insulting him. During the game, he was booed uh, by a lot of the fans, uh, obviously the, particularly those in the curve of Nord. But there's a real split between the fans in the San Siro. When he missed the penalty, he was jeered, notably, by all the ultras. But the, uh, the regular fans tried to cheer him on and keep him going. And there seems to be a big uh, kind of clash where the regular fans think that Cardi's actually done something good and stood up to the Ultras, and that's a good thing because they f- think that they feel uh, are too privileged. The Ultras are not very happy, uh, want lots of things done. So there was a big meeting with the clubs, and Etty came out publicly um, saying that he can't speak about fans in this way. Uh, he issued a public apology, which was widely rejected by the fans. Um, and now, after having this meeting with the club, it seems that he's going to keep the captaincy. They said they will be. Uh, basically giving him some form of punishment but it will be done internally so I expect that will be some sort of fine and there is a possibility of the book um, being uh, republished with that section of the book gone uh, he said it was just a misunderstanding uh, even the ghostwriter now coming out and saying that uh, maybe the words were misinterpreted in some way um, so yeah a, a real big mess so you have all that going on in the background which has had a negative atmosphere on the whole of San Siro the whole game whilst De Boer is struggling to get any consistency out of the team. And also, at the same time, Perisic now claiming uh, talks that uh, he wants to be out of the club in January. Um, and, of course, Brozovic only just getting back into the squad after all his arguments with De Boer. So, a complete mess. <laughs> it's it's like Sunderland in Italy, isn't it? It's, <laughs> it's just like you just couldn't write this stuff. Um, yeah. A very thorough explanation and very, very well put because a lot of people have asked us about what's gone on and you know people tweeted us and we had a couple of messages dms and stuff and it's just like you know i, I thought i know john will be across this it will all be fine because I-, I saw a tweet from one of our mutual friends mm-hmm. and uh i was like what's gone on now and i, I couldn't believe what i was reading so yeah what there's, a mess um, and another defeat as well yeah there's there's a really good i mean we didn't go into the game itself too much because there wasn't a lot to talk about and that was the real talking point obviously no news this week for italy but um if you look up Paolo Bandini uh, on Twitter, he wrote uh, an article about it for The Guardian um, and it covers it in a bit more detail and uh, a lot of the info I got was from his article and from other people, so uh, they're the best people to get absolutely everything on it, but um, yeah, a bit of a mess at Inter at the moment, but as as it stands, he's got the captaincy, but yeah, the Ultras are not very happy. No, that one will run and run, I'm sure. Uh, and indeed, Southampton up next on Thursday night, where uh, you, I, and Ross will have a little natter and after that one goes. So, uh, yes. yes, do tune in on Thursday. Right. Uh, what about the other results um, and indeed the table then? Yeah. Uh, so, Pescara and Sandoria played out a one all draw. Uh, Campagnaro scoring for both teams. Um... <laughs> That was bizarre, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, very good. Uh, Coda getting sent off in that. Uh, Beppe, uh, sorry, Udinese with their new coach, um, got off to a great start away at Juventus, going 1-0 up from Janko, but then Paolo Di Villa uh, getting two goals to give Juve an uh, easy 2-1 win in the end. Fiorentina, Atalanta played out 0-0, as did Genoa and Empoli. Uh, Lezovic getting sent off for Genoa in that game. Uh, Lazio and Bologna could only play out a 1-0. Uh, Chiro Mobley with a very late equaliser in that one. Uh, Sassuolo getting a 2-1 win over Crotone. Uh, Stefano Sensi I think we talked about him before young man to look forward to uh, seeing playing a lot more got uh, got a goal there and uh, this evening's game Palermo 1 Torino 4 apologies if you watch Man United Liverpool you should have been watching this um, unbelievably not a goal from Belotti but two absolute crackers from Lajic uh, Bonesi and Baselli with the goals there um, and as for the table itself I'm just frantically getting it there we go stupid thing I had it a minute ago uh, Juve obviously top of the table in Serie A um, just behind them is Roma and Milan uh, Juve cleared by 5 points Roma and Milan both on 16 so Milan joint 2nd at the moment that's very impressive uh, Torino 4th, Napoli 5th um, for some reason this isn't showing the whole table, I'm terribly sorry this is extremely unprofessional of me if, if you click the down button it all should open up why is it not doing that <laughs> awful, there we go terrible, sorry about that 
That's uh, Torino, so <laughs> Torino and Napoli take up fourth and fifth. Lazio, uh, Lazio and sixth. Uh, down in the bottom, Crotone still rock bottom, just the one point. Empoli on five points. Palermo on six. Udinese and Pascale on seven. Samp just above them on eight. Um, Inter currently eleventh ugh, on eleven points. Uh, yeah, it's just not going very well. Fiorentina as well, down in uh, down fourteenth uh, place. So yeah, not not the best start to a season ever. No, I noticed that uh, Fiorentina yeah, are really struggling at the moment, aren't they? So it's very interesting to see how they're getting on. But, um, well, there you go. Uh, that is that is how Serie A stands at the moment. And um, we will, of course, be back. We've got a couple of questions, actually, that I'll fire your way uh, a little bit later on in the show. So we will be back for those um, in a short while. Yes. Oh, just right. one quick. Oh, the, yes, the game, news. Yeah, the game to look out for. Uh, definitely oh, yes. a big game at San Siro, Milan v Juventus uh, this Saturday. Mm. Uh, quarter to eight kickoff uh, should be an absolute cracker. Yes, yeah, that's a very good point. I forgot about that. It should be a very good watch. That so do do tune in for that. Right then, let's uh, move on to another league. Then um, we're going to come into my neck of the woods, and it's into France. We go with this week's Ligue 1. Right, starting off Liga this week. Um, my, I think I'm, I'm, I'm definitely going to adopt them as my team because you know why wouldn't I? They're top of the table. Uh, nice against Leon, uh, absolutely crack game. Uh, two goals, red card, all sorts going on. Yes, um, it was. It was indeed. I had to watch a lot of this on my phone, which um, anybody that knows me, John knows me well, um, knows that I don't really like streams. Um, I have a bit of a thing about them, but I, I managed to get a lot of this on my phone and um, it was a bit of a crazy game, to be fair. Nice coming out with a 2-0 victory, richly deserved. Um, Leon were, were beyond poor. I think it's, it's probably a fair, fair way of putting it. Um, so very, very good victory for Nice and, and well-deserved. I have to say that there was it was a lot of niggle in this game from from the early on earliest point on there was a lot of kicking out a lot of raising of of hands and and gesturing and all that goes with it and uh, that resulted in in a red card for Nabil Fakir um for kicking out I believe it was Paul Bice he kicked out at and uh, it was Bice himself who'd fired Nice into a fifth minute lead lovely finish actually has to be said really clean contact with his strike and uh, yeah Fakir sending off in the 28th minute he, Go and have a look if you haven't seen it yourself. Judge for yourself. I was um, I was torn. I couldn't really decide if this. I think there is a. I think there is a movement towards the player. That would be all I would say. I think there is a a, a bit of a kick out, and um, you can see why the referee has has reached for the uh, reach for the card. But um, nevertheless, that kind of cost Leon. They never really recovered for that. And uh, Seri turning in the second goal in the seventy sixth minute after uh, Belhanda's shot had come back off the post. Another really, really nice finish, actually, to be fair. Into the far corner, 2-0, game was done. There was even time for Super Mario to miss a penalty um, after he had been he himself had been fouled in the box uh, by the young the young defender for, for Leon Gaspar. And, uh, yeah, pretty pretty thoroughly unhappy day for, for Olympic Lyonnais, who um, they're, they're very quietly drifting down the table at the moment, and uh, it seems to have escaped quite a few people's knowledge, or notice, I should say. But but, um, yeah, they're down in eighth now. And uh, well, what are they now? Ten points off the pace, uh, which is indeed currently being set by Nice. Yeah, um, not great. Uh, also, even more frustrating, I'm sure, for Ligon is Fakir obviously getting that red card. Um, would that be three games or would it be more because of possible I... violent conduct? Yeah, I've got a feeling it's going to be more because the the French uh, Football Federation, obviously, we know about their history with uh, the, the, the incident with Lorient forward Benjamin Jeannot, who was um, it was dismissed for a, a push on the referee, and I think he got was it six or seven games in the end. I think it was. Yeah. Um, they've got previous the French FA, and if again, you know, you'd have to judge it for yourself. You have to look at the video and make your own mind up. But 
there, there is Fakir was wound up, and and he he has got this spiky side to his personality, which some people think is the reason why he won't ever sort of make it to the very top top level. Um, but I would argue plenty of players have had a bit of niggle in their in their time and have, have made it. So I wouldn't write him off, but he does. A, I would suggest he's in for a fairly long spell on the sidelines after this uh, little uh, little skirmish. Yep. But Lacazette back, so <laughs> yes. Well, that's that's the bonus. Yeah. Yeah. And also, if if Leon can go to um, the J Stadium and get some sort of result this week, uh, and Lacazette's involved, it will be worth it. That would be the only thing I would say. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't expect them to. I be, to be perfectly honest, I expect Juve to to mow, mow them down. But then I also expected Juve to mow down Sevilla, and that didn't turn out so well. So any result for Leon away away in, in Juve will be this result won't feel quite so bad, but. It's all very well getting into the Champions League, but not very well if you crash out of the Champions League and then you're halfway down the league having done so. So they need to change things around pretty sharpish. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we'll move on to um, what, well, I thought was a surprise result. Anyway, maybe I was wrong. Uh, Toulouse 3, Monaco 1. Um, I certainly didn't see this coming and possibly one of the best 1-2s I've ever seen for a goal. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it's it is. It, I suppose it is a shock result because Monaco have, have been so good um, in, in the in the weeks prior and and this season they've they've really been a breath of fresh air. That said, to lose his home form, um, I don't know if you've if you've seen this, but it's been pretty damn impressive um, all the way back to sort of. December of um, uh, December, sorry, March of, of last year of, of this year. So sort of when they had, do you remember that they had that incredible run towards the end of the season where they survived yeah. and they got the late. Well, they've um, they they won three of the last four home games and then coming into this season, um, they they've gone on to win the next five. So there's clearly something working. If you take it, technically, it's four four wins at home from four this season. But if you take into consideration the back end of last season as well, it's not a bad home result. And if you look at the the four wins they've had. At home this season 4-1 over Bordeaux 2-1 over Gangomp 2-0 over PSG and now 3-1 over Monaco so I suppose it's not a big surprise if you look at that form but the way they did it and as you say that the um the, the you, you saw the one two goal then yeah um, Trejo, yeah <laughs> it, it was it was delightful wasn't it a hell of a header actually as well and he reacted really well but but yeah i mean it's it's another it's six grand now i think that martin braithwaite is uh is yes contributed to charity two, yeah two goals in the game and the assist didn't he yeah Absolutely, and he, you know, he's on fire, and and they they just seem to be clicking, and and Dupraz is, is he, he's kept the spirit that he had at the back end of last season, where they got that that survival, um, and they they're overperforming massively. I mean, they're fourth in the table at the moment, and um, they're actually sniffing at Monaco's heels now, only two points behind them. So yeah, I I don't think it will last the season. I still think they're going to lack goals if if Braithwaite stops scoring. That's the worry. I mean, he's got six goals and six starts this season. Um, Ola Toivonen is is the other centre forward, and beyond that they've got sort of uh, um, Eduard the uh, the young forward who's very inexperienced I mean he's actually had eight appearances this season but no goals they don't really have another goal scorer what they do have though is pace and abundance talent and abundance young players um, Jan Bodiger is one to keep an eye on definitely but yeah, I think that they're riding the crest of, crest of a wave at the moment long may it continue as for Monaco I just wonder I just wonder if they might have an eye on the Champions League yeah, I was um, going to say that maybe they're a bit distracted by midweek fixture. Yeah, I mean, they're away in Moscow, which is not an easy task. But if they can get something from that, particularly if they can get a win, they're all but qualified. So I do just wonder if maybe their focus was taken away. Nice to see Valéry Germain getting another goal. Um, he's a player I like a lot. And he's he's slowly but surely sort of creeping back into um, into the hearts of the, the Monegasque family. So, um, yeah, it's, 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 not, it's not catastrophic for Monaco, but... Given the fact that PSG are slowly raising from their slumber, it, it might be a bit of a missed opportunity. Yeah. Now, on to uh, what our Danny would call a real schlubber knocker uh, oh, down yes. near the bottom of the table. Um, your friend and mine, uh, your favourite, Ninga, uh, yes. was all over this game. Goals, assists, a lot. 
he was yeah he's um he's he's a player i really really like i think he's 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 one of these yet another player from this that from Liga that, that people go oh french football is not very good and then you see how many strikers how many sort of attacking midfielders technical players come out of of the league and you start to go mm, actually it's not that bad and um Ninga, that's that he's got another as you say two goals and an assist it's now five goals in his last two because he bagged a hat trick at, at dijon last week um no i'm not going to do a mustard joke i promise but um yeah he he's he was banging form and two i don't know if you saw them but two lovely finishes in this guy in this game really yeah. really good finishes and uh his movement and his pace is is what makes montpellier tick when montpellier tick they've actually been on a pretty poor run as to be said montpellier for the, the last couple of weeks and two defeats and two draws in the last four really didn't look particularly good losing at home to Mets, getting crushed away in Leon. obviously that draw with, with Dijon last week was was a starting point but they are still struggling sort of bottom end of the table but this was a big victory for them because Khan themselves have been struggling um and Montpellier getting in front Ninga sort of putting them in front early but they conceded through Yeo and it was 1-1 uh Mune got the uh, a 2-1 goal and Santini with a a fantastic looping header to make it 2-2 two, two. and and you thought mm, are they going to throw it away again and they actually had Mune sent off then the 71st minute but then despite having 10 men Ninka got the winner on 77 so it, it's a good result for Montpellier I'm I'm not sure obviously they're never going to be the side that wins a title again uh, that was a very much a one-off season but I can't help but feeling maybe they're looking at the moment thinking we're probably underachieving where they are in the table but good result I just wanted to highlight it because it's very easy to pick out the top clubs it's always nice to just drift into the um the sort of middle clubs and see how they're getting on and uh yeah Casimir Ninga is is definitely one that's worth keeping an eye on for anybody who likes a, a hipster player to follow yeah absolutely and um, brilliant name as well <laughs> yes absolutely uh do you want to give us the arrest results from the league Yes, indeed. So the uh, obviously we covered the two Friday night games. The, uh, the the early game on the Saturday was PSG away at Nancy. They got a two one victory. Still don't look convincing to me. There are signs that they're slowly getting back into gear, but still not convinced. Uh, Lucas Moore and a, a nice uh, finish from Cavani, lobbed finish for the second, and Diara, former Charlton man, I think he has um, got one back for Nancy, but wasn't enough. So PSG claimed the points. Uh, Lorient lost again. Oh, for goodness sake! Uh, this time in the Breton Derby at home to non it's a, it's a really really worrying situation for Le Melo now uh, Bamu and Gillet with the goals for Nantes a goal on his debut for Amel uh, Pierre-Yves Amel for Lorient with a header but stank, scant consolation another defeat so I'm worried um, Angers well they made Bastia angry because they went to Corsica and picked up three points uh, two goals from Jeju um, sandwiched a, a Bifuma goal from Bastia so good result that for Angers who are on the climb all of a sudden Lille lost again um, they really are in free fall serious problems there Prevo with a winner for Gangon in that game Ren Montpellier uh, sorry Ren Montpellier Ren Bordeaux played out a 1-1 draw on Sunday uh, Diego Contento for Ren putting through his own net that was uh, the opener uh, Palios scoring for Bordeaux that was the leveller St Etienne got another last minute penalty having done so I think it was last week it was the week before uh, the international break uh, Nolan Roux smashing home a 91st or not, sorry 96th minute penalty uh, after Dijon had led through uh, Lise Milou and uh, that ended 1-1 and Marseille who we'll touch on in a second they finally got a victory with uh, a 1-0 victory over Mets at the uh, at the velodrome with a goal from Baffer Timby Gomis much needed given their season at the moment yeah so uh, speaking of Marseille uh, do you want to do the new section now Yes, I will. I'll very quickly just give you the table, uh, or top half anyway. Nice are top, PSG second, Monaco, uh, Toulouse, Gangon make up the top five. Bordeaux, Rennes, Lyon, St. Etienne and Angers down to 10th. Uh, down at the bottom, Nancy, Lorient and Lille. Yes, Lille in 18th. Uh, they are the bottom three at the moment. Dijon, Cannes, Montpellier and Bastia kind of looking over their shoulders and uh, Marseille themselves are up to 12th with that victory and uh, yeah we did have some news uh, that broke today today being Monday time of recording um, the the Louis Dreyfus area uh, era sorry has finally gone uh, Marseille have officially announced that they have been sold and Frank McCourt is uh, is indeed the owner of Marseille as of today it's the is the former LA Dodgers owner uh, baseball team in America. Um, he's succeeded Margarita Louis Dreyfus for an undisclosed fee. It's believed to be in the region of 50 million euros, which it sounds like a lot of money, but when you're buying a club, 
uh, especially with the um, you know with the the, the the sway that Marseille have had over the years and the history of the club it's not a bad price um, however you are also buying a club that's massively a mess so mm, make of it what you will uh, the official statement released was today a new chapter begins in the great history of Olympic to Marseille a chapter that I'm proud and honoured to be part of I have no doubt in the challenges that, that, that OM have to face on the pitch and off it um, in recent years they've had a negative impact on the fans by sticking by the club though, the fans have shown their loyalty and their unwavering support which shows the power of sport and the affection they have for the club uh, that was McCourt's statement so done deal Marseille have new owners. Um, there's quite a lot of links with um, George Mendes, from what I can gather. Um, so make of that what you will. But uh, we shall see, because I think Marseille might be rather busy in January. Oh, absolutely. Um, do you want to give us a game to look out for for this weekend? Yes, I was uh, just just trying to do that, actually, as uh, my browser decided to just completely shut down on me. But um, it's a bit of a tough one to pick out as far as... Um, the. Uh, stepping away from the obvious and i can't really step away from the obvious psg marseille um is the big game le classique next sunday night uh at 7 45 uk time i would just say though keep an eye on mets against nice which is the afternoon game on the sunday as well um for obvious reasons i suppose nice top of the table but mets decent at home um and have impressed quite a few they're sitting 11th at the moment but I think that might be a bigger test for Nice than they think, particularly given the fact they've got this Europa League game in midweek as well. Wonderful. Well, I'll uh, right. hand back over to you, mate. I thank you very much. Um, and uh, we're we're going to experiment now, John, because um, we, uh, as you say, this is the last week that we hopefully are drooless. Uh, so we're going to attempt to do something a little bit different. We shall explain all in a short moment. It's this week's trip to Germany and the Bundesliga. Right, so what we're going to do, John, is in the absence of Drew, um, we're just going to kind of try and just have a, a brief sort of chat about the weekend in general. So rather than picking out too many individual games, we're just going to pick up on a few kind of talking points for the weekend and just see who we are. Um, we, we should touch on there was a stat that went round from the weekend's German football. Six missed penalties. Um, I don't know if you saw that. Two of them were for, for Munch and Gladbach, so I'm sure you saw those. Yes, yeah, I did Not see good. those. <laughs> mm. Not good. You did see also Bayern Munich. Um, 2 2 draw with Eintracht Frankfurt. Um, Marco Fabian scoring a wonderfully chested equaliser when they were down to 10 men. That was a, a thing of beauty. Um, what do you reckon to Bayern and, and the Carlo? Because you obviously know Carlo Ancelotti well from his time in Italy and his time at Real Madrid. You know, obviously a very good manager, but do you think there's a bit of a worry about Bayern's form at the moment with that 2 2 draw? Um, it is a little bit. The, the... It's not so much defensively that I would worry about them. I always thought that you could get at Bayern Munich um, because they are so forward-thinking and they do push up very high and uh, they did it under Guardiola as well. Um, I think there's the the intensity has gone out of the team somewhat. Uh, they don't press as rigorously. Um, they don't seem to do things quite as quickly as they did under Pep. Um, and that's I, you know, this kind of natural when you change from Guardiola to Ancelotti. They're different managers in that style. But uh, even Anya Robben came out and said this week that um, you know maybe the players need to wake up themselves a little bit and and do things a little bit harder, uh, a little bit faster. Um, not going exactly all the way back to how Pep had them playing, but um, just to realise that they can't just turn up and win every game and that they do have to put the performances in still um, it was a good performance from Eintracht Frankfurt though to, to get the result and uh, also going down to 10 men as well so managing to stay in the game um, is really good for them but yeah I, I wouldn't be worried about Bayern this is the sort of the typical thing with Ancelotti is that he's got such a fantastic record in Europe but his league record is not so great um, I'd still expect Bayern to win the league um, just because they've got so much quality at the club, I, I can't see them not doing it. Um, but yeah, Champions League and everything, mm, maybe maybe not so much now. Mm, yes, yeah, so it's, it's one of those you keep an eye on. They seem to be sort of just 
just off the boil a little bit at, at the moment. And speaking of off the boil, um, that brings us to Dortmund, who've gone off the boil as well. Uh, kind of a one-one a draw at home to uh, to Hertha Bayerse. I love saying that. It's which, on the face of it, is not a bad result given how good Hertha have been this season. But it, it's, um, I suppose, it, they'll look at it as a game they probably would have would have expected to win. Um, Stocker put, put Hertha one up, and they relied on a, a Bamiyan goal in the uh, 80th minute with 10 minutes to go. Sunning's off a piece for Stocker himself and Emre Moore um, also walking the plank in that game. Um, Dortmund again, I mean, it, it's sort of got reeks of previous, hasn't it? They've drawn this game when Bayern Munich have also drawn. So yet again, they've missed out on a chance to, to climb the table. Yeah, I mean, Hertha again are having a very good season and uh, the Stocker goal was very good. I can't remember who it was who gave the assist, but a lovely little uh, back heel through to Valentin Stocker for the goal. Um <sighs> I've got to say, Dortmund were a Ibisevich, little bit... by the way. Ah, there we go, yeah. Um, <laughs> Dortmund were a little bit unlucky. Uh, Aubameyang uh, hitting, uh, having a shot that was sort of palmed up in the air and, and came back off the post and he couldn't get the rebound. And um, he did obviously score a goal. But they seem to, again, they have dipped a little bit in form. Um, I don't think it's something that's going to last. It's one of those things they have got just a very young team and they'll have these little blips every now and again. Um I would, I still would have expected them to push Bayern better than they have done so far, though, just because of the quality of their players. Um, and I've got to say as well, I feel very sorry for Emre Moore for getting sent off, um, who was essentially being rugby tackled as he was running along, and then finally, after being awarded a free kick after what seemed like an absolute age, um, pushed the offending player. I can't remember who it was now, but just pushed him in the chest. And I'm sure everyone knows Emre Moore's about four foot nothing. Um, and the uh, the player he pushed was probably well over six foot and went flailing to the floor, claiming uh, I don't know, like he'd been hit by Mike Tyson or something. So yeah, a li- little bit harsh there. So um, they won't be happy with that. But yeah, I expect Dortmund to bounce back. But it's it's disappointing when you see that the league maybe is a little bit more open than you thought. Um, there are still some surprise results and surprise positions within the league and how everyone's doing, but you would expect Dortmund to be doing a little bit better than they are. Yeah, I agree. It, it is a bit of a crazy Bundesliga this season. I must admit, I, I was thinking that as I looked at the results from the weekend and, and you look at the current league table, I mean, we, we see Bayern Munich are top. Uh, not really a big surprise there. However, uh, when you see you see Cologne uh, or FC Köln, whichever you prefer to, to call them, they're up there. Um, second place, RB Leipzig, uh, another victory for them. Uh, they're up in third place now, 15 points, plus seven. They won away in uh, in Wolfsburg, and that saw the end of a manager, did it not? Um, what do we think to the uh, the sacking or dismissal or whatever you want to call it of Dieter Hecking? Um, I'm I was talking uh, only briefly to uh, Drew about this earlier. Um, <laughs> I was just more than anything surprised that it took so long to happen. Um Things clearly weren't working out there at Wolfsburg. Uh, Drew says they still basically have never really fixed the issue, the fact that Kevin De Bruyne went and they've tried to keep it exactly the same without replacing him. Um, if you can't replace De Bruyne, then change your system slightly. Um, you know, adjust to the players you've got, and they just haven't done it. And it just clearly wasn't working under Hecking. I think after a certain time, amount of time, players just won't perform for a manager um, perhaps not intentionally um, they may listen in training and take it all in but they just don't go out on the pitch and do it and what you're telling them just isn't working and sometimes you just need a change um, no word yet on who it is who's going to be taking over but um, I'd expect some sort of bounce back that that normally kind of happens but uh, yeah for Leipzig really really good uh, the penalty missed in this game as well wasn't there um, yes, Forsberg, yeah, who got the win went on to get the winner. Yeah, cracking goal he scored um, mm. to get the winner, but yeah, another penalty missed in this one. Um, yeah, Leipzig have been just... Uh, obviously, we talked before about how a lot of the fans of other clubs don't like them, but I don't think anyone expected them to do this well. I think people said, you know, maybe Europa League, but mm. yeah, they really, really are surprising with how good they're performing. Um, okay, maybe not a massive surprise to get a, a victory over Wolfsburg, but to be third in in the league already uh, at this point in the season is, is really good. When you consider, like you said, that Dortmund are below them, um, Leverkusen, Gladbach, you know, other teams who are m- much more or con- at least expected to be more consistent and be up there, um, mm. really, really are impressive. 
Yeah, and um, yeah, they just keep rolling on, don't they? Imagine if they got into the Champions League. Imagine the reaction to some of the other clubs if they did. I mean, that would be something else. But yeah, it's, it's, it's early days. But um, as again, going back to the, the league table, you find Wolfsburg in 14th, Werder Bremen 13th, Schalke 16th, Hamburg 17th. Sorry, I, I don't know if that is a big surprise. Maybe Hamburg fans won't think it is. Uh, Leverkusen 10th, uh, your club back down in 9th. It, it really is a, a cracker season. Hoffenheim under under Nagelsmann up in 6th. It's uh, it's amazing. And a little shout out to um, Anthony Modest as well, whose goal for uh, Köln this weekend, absolute beauty. The touch to set it up was Current top really... goal scorer in the Bundesliga. Anthony Absolutely. Yeah. And he could not hit a cow's ass with a banjo in France. It's, <laughs> it's, it's so funny how things work out, but... Yep. Um, also, a notable thing from the weekend, 80,800 for the dortmund Hertha game. Wow. Yeah. That's, uh, that's quite some attendance, isn't it? But there are um, German sides in action in the week, so we will sort of keep across them. And as you say, Drew will be back next week. Um, we did have two questions in the onion bag, um, which I'm going to get to when we do listen to questions. But I will just do one of them now, because it comes from Tom, who's at Wolfsburger underscore UK, uh, the uh, English um, fan site uh, Wolfsburg. Do give him a follow if you if you like your Wolfsburgs. Um, he um, he wanted to ask about hacking, and he just simply asked who the best replacement is for hacking, and also our, our very own Mr. Uh, Mr. Schrader um, asked the same thing as well. Um, he was sort of saying that how long he actually said. Uh, how long before Wolfsburg find a new manager? This was prior to the sacking today. So he obviously <laughs> saw something coming. And and he touched on the same thing he's done. He said, surely they need to change the style uh, to you know, to because it's not mm. fitting the team. So is there anybody that you think in mind, out of work, anybody that you think would be a good fit there? The the one man who immediately jumped to my, my mind anyway um, when I heard about Hecking was actually Lucien Favre. But mm. he obviously had gone gone to Nice and they missed their chance there. Um, and I know obviously he wanted to break away from work for a little while, which he had. Um, but I just think they they could have gone with him earlier in the season. They had an opportunity, maybe. He would have been one. Um, honestly, from within the Bundesliga itself, I really don't know. I asked Drew and he was uh, not necessarily short of ideas, but just he really didn't know who it was going to be. So... It'll be interesting. Um, I'm not sure who on the board there at Wolfsburg will make that decision. Um, but, you know, there's been names banded around. I've seen people saying things like Mancini, obviously, is uh, in Turkey at the moment, isn't he? Yeah. Um, you know, managers like that. I, I can't see someone like him going to, uh, no offence to Wolfsburg, a club of that size, despite the fact he's in Turkey. I just think he, if he was going to come back into sort of, or uh, mainland uh, Western Europe, then he'd want a bigger name club. Um, so I'd expect someone from within the Bundesliga or maybe within the coaching staff might might get a bump up. Mm. It's got to be Sven, really, surely, isn't it? Maybe, uh, <laughs> oh, or or of course, um, we're 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 both missing the obvious target, um, the man who is clearly too good for Swansea. Uh, Ryan Giggs obviously is available. Oh, that is, um, yes, that's you true. Know, and, Naturally, he sees himself that he should go straight into a big job. So clearly, uh, this is the job for him. But okay. um, maybe you can take Gary Neville with him, who did brilliantly. Did brilliantly. Yes. Yeah. yeah absolutely. <laughs> I I wonder if Wolf, Wolfsburg might go completely rogue here. I, I wonder if they might go completely outside the box. Um, I, I look at uh, someone like a Laurent Blanc potentially. Uh, oh yes, yes. Somebody who you know, just somebody with completely different ideas, who's out of work but looking to get He's, back in. Um, um, oh god, I've completely forgotten his name. Uh, the fellow who was at Chelsea and then Spurs, then went to Russia. Andre Villas-Boas. Yes, where's where's yes. AVB now? I don't know. I I'm sure he took another job. I'm sure he did because he left Zenit St Petersburg, didn't yes, he? Yes. Yeah. Um, here I go. Look at me uh, googling away. No shame whatsoever <laughs> in this. Uh, Andre Villas Boas is currently listed as a coach with no club. So yes, oh, indeed, he is. AVB maybe be a good shout. He's he's mm. a young enough manager, and he's um, despite the fact that he did manage Tottenham, I always thought he was a decent manager, and he had exciting mm. ideas and tried to play decent football. Um, yep. So maybe he could be he could be one who wants to uh, come back from the wilderness of Russia. Yeah, or or indeed Sam Allardyce um, <laughs> is the option. So uh, or, or Roberto Di Matteo, I suppose, is out of, out of uh, action now, being sacked by Villa. But surely after what he did at Schalke, they wouldn't touch him with a barge pole. But no, no. 
Mm. Yes, write in um, if you if you think uh, if you think if you're you know if you're suitable for the job. <laughs> Yes, yeah, indeed, yeah, if you want to apply, write in. Um, okay, well, I think we, we, we've we just about got our way through the, the should British we, League. Should week. we give him a game to watch for next I week? I think we sh- I suppose we should run down the results as well, shouldn't we? We didn't really go through them <laughs> completely. So we covered Dortmund, we covered Gladbach 0-0 with Hamburg, uh, Cologne winning 2-1 over Ingolstadt, Augsburg and Schalke drawing one all in that game. Uh, Cracking Hoffenheim goal from the... Bintaleb in that game. Oh, it was superb, wasn't he? He probably hit that. Um, wearing the number 10, though? Not so sure about that. Hoffenheim uh, beating Freiburg by two goals to one. Uh, goal there for Kramaric uh, from the penalty spot. One of the few successful penalties this weekend. Uh, Werder Bremen with another win. They continue to um, get better over Leverkusen this week. Um, good result, that, for them. Leverkusen sliding down the table again. Mites with a 2-1 victory over Darmstadt. Uh, I love the, the Darmstadt penalty scorer, uh, Gondorf. It's just the greatest name ever, isn't it? Um, and that leaves us where we are at the moment on the league table, which we briefly touched on, as I said, by Munich, uh, a top of the tree, which I don't think will surprise too many people, if we're completely honest. Um, as we said, Cologne up in second. That will surprise quite a few people. Uh, Leipzig third, Hertha fourth, Dortmund fifth, Hoffenheim sixth in the top six positions there. Um, Leverkusen and, and uh, Gladbach, as we said, ninth and tenth. Freiburg uh, doing all right this season so far. They're only 11th down at the bottom, though. Ingolstadt looking really, really rough. One point from their seven games played. Hamburg even worse uh, for the size of the club. Two points from their seven played. Schalke in the relegation zone as well. That was unthinkable at the start of the season. Four points with Darmstadt, Wolfsburg and Bremen all looking over their shoulder in 15th, 14th and 13th respectively. Uh, as for a game... Ooh, I know yeah. what my pick is. <laughs> Go on, you, you have one and I'll have one. Who, okay. who are you going for? I, I don't want to watch it because it's going to be horrible, but uh, Bayern Munich at home... Uh, playing uh, my Borussia Mönchengladbach. <laughs> yes, that's the 5.30 on the Saturday, isn't it? Mm. See, I'm looking at Leipzig-Bremen, personally. Uh, Ooh, I mean, yes. schalke Mites might be all right as well, but um, in fact, hamburg uh, Frankfurt as well. There's quite a few this weekend, actually. Hertha Berlin-Cologne as well. That there's, would be a very good game. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a lot here. Um, I th- I th- I'll stick with my original, Leipzig-Werder-Bremen. Werder improving, leipzig Obviously, you're tearing it up at the moment. Um, I fancy in a way a way win there. Don't know why. Um, just just have a little sneaking suspicion. Um, but if if I had to um, pick a hipster's choice, Hamburg Frankfurt on the Friday might be worth a look because I just think both teams can't really defend. Um, Hamburg desperately need the points. Frankfurt are pretty good on the break, so that might be uh, might be a goal fest. So wait for that one to be nil nil. Um, right. OK, well, that's uh, that's that. I say we've got a couple of other German questions that we'll do our best to answer. Um, but as usual, if you want a, uh, a proper answer from someone who knows a little bit more than us, we know our be- we know the basics. But uh, Drew is your man for anything technical on the German side. So get in touch with Drew. Right. Uh, we will leave our whistle stop tour around our big four leagues there. And uh, we're just going to take a brief segue now to find out about what's going on in another league in Europe. And it's this week's Best of the Rest. Okay, this week we're going to take a very brief trip into the Netherlands, Yoshi, uh, for a update from Holland. Uh, it's the Eri Divisie, and uh, Drew's a happy man right now because Feyenoord are absolutely tearing the league a new one. Nine straight victories this season for Gio van Bronckhorst men, and they are top of the tree. Uh, played nine, won nine, 25 goals scored, eight only conceded, only, sorry, three only conceded, three goals conceded in nine games. I mean, wow, that's pretty impressive, whatever league you're in, isn't it, to be fair? Uh, they sit top, as I say, 27 points. They continued their unbeaten start with a win over NEC Nijmegen this weekend. They actually went behind, but two goals from Jorgensen and from Kramer late on, getting the points for Feyenoord. Ajax continue the chase. Uh, they got a 2-0 victory over Ardo Den Haag this weekend. Danny Cl- Davy Klassen and Traore with the goals there. So Ajax are five points off the pace in second uh, with seven wins, a draw and a defeat from their nine games. Hirenveen 
Uh, also impressing this season. 3-0 victory over Groningen this weekend. They're up in third. Uh, PSV, PSV, whichever you prefer. They are fourth. Um, also on 18 points level with here in Veen. Having a bit of a mixed season this year. Again, Champions League, you would ha- only assume is, is having a bit of an effect on their season. They've also got a hideous third kit. Do look that one up. Uh, they got a 1-1 draw at home to Heracles this weekend. That will not be the result they expected to get. RZ Alkmaar having a good season as well. Up in fifth, Vitesse Arnhem and Twente make up the top seven. Um, down at the bottom, Peck Swallow not having the greatest of times. Neither are Rhoda JC or Groningen, who are all on six points and occupy the 16th, 17th and 18th positions. Uh, Willem Twey, Go Ahead Eagles, Heracles and NEC and indeed Utrecht looking over their shoulders all the way up to 11th place. Um, Ardo Den Haag, sadly, are the team out of form right now. Five straight defeats. Uh, they are falling quicker than a stone through the water. Currently 10th, but um, very much looking downwards rather than upwards. As far as a, a couple of stats go this season, top scorers at the moment, well, fine or uh, not surprisingly, are uh, well represented. Um, they have the top score in the league. It's uh, a man by the name of Mr. Jorgensen, uh, who has seven goals from his uh, first nine games. Not bad. Nikolai Jorgensen, he's a Danish international. So he's having a lovely old time, the 25-year-old. Um, as far as the assists go, this is an interesting one as well. Uh, Ziek, I believe it's pronounced. I don't know if you've heard of this kid, John. He's a Moroccan, plays for Ajax. Um, Ooh, big thing uh, to expect. I've, I've heard the name. I haven't seen him play. Yes, he's uh, he, he's he's quite the talent. Twenty three years of age, Hakim Z. I, th- I think it's pronounced Yesh. Uh, it may. I hope it is. If it's not, then shoot me. I'm sure Drew's listening to this, shaking his head in disbelief as I speak. But um, yeah, he's a product of the Hiramveen Academy. Went to Twente and then got the move to Ajax this summer, and so far doing a good job on the old assists charts. So uh, yes, um, a busy busy time in in Holland at the moment. Obviously, um, so it's, it's nice to. I don't know about you, but I, I sort of always think it's nice when you see like fine or Ajax and PSV all in the top four positions. Um, it, it kind of just just makes you go, ah, yes, I remember the good old days. So, yeah, it's it, it's it's a league that is close this season, um, and uh, everyone's looking forward to when the uh, the top sides meet. And wouldn't you just know it, John? They meet this weekend. Oh, it's almost like you planned it. <laughs> I know, and I genuinely didn't either. Uh, Feyenoord face Ajax. Uh, Feyenoord are the home side. It's a one thirty kickoff on Sunday, the twenty third of October. So, uh, just a reminder: Feyenoord currently five points clear of their rivals. So, if they win that as well, eight points clear after ten games. It's quite a substantial uh, gap opening up. Um, I don't watch a huge amount of Dutch football. I have to confess but I will be watching this one because I think it could be a cracker. So do tune in for that. Um, So that's another best of the rest done. If you do have a league that you want us to put focus on, please do let us know. We will do our very best to, to cram it in throughout the season. We've got plenty of plenty of time this season to cover your various leagues. And uh, we will be taking a trip back to MLS again in the coming weeks because the playoffs begin soon. And that's a little, little plug for, um, Jimmy and Angunas uh, doing a bit of writing for us at the moment, John. So uh, he's going to have a blog posted soon. Oh, wonderful. Uh, I, I apologise. We've been a little bit behind on the blogs. We've still got to put Jake Bayliss's uh, Villa blog up, which we haven't forgotten. It's just uh, a question of getting everybody sorted time-wise. But we will get those blogs posted. And uh, Jimmy's blog about the MLS playoff system will be going up, uh, hopefully, at some point this week as well. So keep your eyes peeled for that. and uh, Or just tweet Jimmy um, at Anenguna. I'm sure he'll fill you in. It's getting very exciting in the USA. So we'll be back across that very soon. Right then, a couple of segments to go then. Let's uh, let's turn our attention to who we're going to profile this week. And it is time for The Hipster's Choice. Right then, I know this one's going to make you happy, John. It's going to make me happy as well. He's had a couple of mentions already tonight, um, and we've had a question about him, funnily enough, tonight as well, which I'm going to come on to in a short period of time. But without any further ado, this week's Hipster's Choice is a young man, an Italian young man indeed, who goes by the name of Andrea Bellotti. 
So what do we know about Andrea Belotti? Well, he is the Torino frontman and indeed, hopefully, we seem to think the future of Italy, the number nine. He was born on the 20th of December 1993, which makes him 22 years of age for those counting. He's 5 foot 11 inches tall, which makes him 3 inches taller than me. Damn hit. Uh, he is 81 kilograms or 179 pounds in old money. He's a right-footed attacker and you can follow him slash stalk him on Twitter at Gallo Bellotti. Uh, what do we know then? He was born in Caligante in Lombardy, which is, I believe, in Italy. I'm pretty sure it is. Uh, he started his career at the second largest team of the province, uh, the Serie B club, uh, Albo, Albino Lefe. I hope I've got that right. Probably haven't. Nevertheless, we'll skip on. Uh, in August, two, sorry, he made his debut, sorry, I should say, in, in August, the senior team for the 2011-12 season, although the club was relegated to the Lega Pro Second Divisionale in the 2012-13 season. And in 2012, he scored 12 goals in 31 appearances, catapulted, uh, sorry, capturing the attention of Palermo, who were recently re relegated from Serie A. I know, Palermo relegated, who'd have thought? In August 2013, Bellotti went on loan and he had, uh, having just been relegated to Serie B, it was a co-ownership option. He scored 10 goals in 24 appearances for Palermo in 13-14 and after earning promotion back to Serie A, uh, Serie A, the club exercised the option to purchase 50% of the player in July 2014 and bought him outright in September of the same year. Velocity made a great start to Serie A, scoring twice on the 24th of September 2014, providing the man of the match performance in a 3-3 draw away against Napoli. However, he only managed six goals in 39 appearances over the season and was very much second fiddle to the inform Paolo Di Bala, who uh, struggled uh, and he then struggled the previous two seasons. Um, and him and Franco Vasquez obviously were the, the standout players for that Palermo team. So Pelosi was rather left behind. The team finished in mid-table. So on August the 18th, 2015, he was signed by Torino for a fee, a fee of 7.5 million euros, which might just end up being a bargain, by the way. He started 34 games for Torino, and though, although he only scored one goal in the first half of the season, he racked up 11 more in the second half of the season when Chiro Mobile became his partner in a 3-5-2 formation. Uh, five goals and one assist in five league appearances. Bellotti's continued his form this season, scoring a hat-trick in Torino's 5-1 victory over Bologna on August 28th. Under coach Mihailovic, Bellotti plays as a centre-forward in a 4-3-3 formation. And that also paved the way for his uh, his appearances for the national team. He's represented them at the youth team levels, impressing in the otherwise disappointing under-21 championships in 2005. He was called up to the senior team in 2016 by Ventura. And he played a friendly against France on the 1st of September 2016. And indeed, the uh, World Cup qualifica qualification matches against Israel recently, where he made his senior debut uh, and indeed got on the score sheet on October the 9th with the goal against one of the goals, sorry, in the away victory over Macedonia. Um, what do we know about his skill set then? Well, he boasts a balanced range of attributes. He's not naturally breast, breast? blessed, goodness me, uh, with size or a typical target man, but uh, he uses his physicality intelligently. And in addition to being strong, uh, having a strong work, I think that provides a base for his teammates from which to feed off of. He was effective in front of goal. He works hard defensively running back to retrieve possession and intercept passes. And despite not being overly tall, he wins a lot of aerial duels. You can, of course, find out more about him on all the relevant uh, bits and bobs and places and whatnot. And we will post a video in the coming days so you can check him out. So, uh, Andrea Bellotti then, John. Um, player you know that I like. Um, mm. Not just because... Pretty hair, but um, because he's uh, uh, something about him uh, captured the imagination. As soon as we saw him, I think both you and I said mm, there might be a player there. And um, th thus far this season, he seems to be um, fulfilling the potential. So, how how highly do you rate him, and how far do you think he uh, he might end up going in his career? Yeah, he's um, he's drawing a lot of attention, particularly this season. Uh, started very well and and got his uh, full national debut for Italy, getting his first goal, as you said. Um, and that's really got him more in the papers, at least over here anyway, in the, in the UK. He's obviously been spoken about in Italy for quite a while. Um, he is considered to be sort of the future of the national team, um, their next sort of great hope for a striker. He's been compared to Viali and uh, Bonimba, uh, an old player from the uh, 70s, uh, Roberto Bonisenga. Uh, he used to play for Inter, fully enough. Um, 
I, what I like about him, I mean, you described it really well, how he uses his physicality intelligently despite the fact he isn't the biggest player in the world. You know, he's under six foot, but he does still have quite a stocky frame and he reuses that strength very smartly. And he's not just an out-and-out striker. I mean, that is definitely his best position, without a doubt. Um, but he can play wide. He can play as a second striker if you need him to. Um, he hasn't got uh, the long-distance pace of a typical winger, but he can beat a man if he has to. But his intelligence in the box and his movement is really good, and he's fantastic in the air, uh, especially for someone his size. So um, he's, he's perfect. He's a very old-fashioned forward, not the typical sort of centre-forward you see today. But what you would get is, when you look at, say... Uh, Diego Costa, um, Didier Drogba, um, maybe to a lesser extent uh, Romelu Lukaku, those kind of strikers, they're a bit more of a throwback to an older era in that they use their strength and muscle to just sort of get past the player rather than a bit of skill and trickery to nutmeg a man. They will just power past someone and and get a finish and he's got that about him. Um, And he's at a club that is really looking to go places and move forwards and get into Europe and try and keep that sort of being in Europe sustained and move up and up and up. Um, I don't think he'll be at Torino long. I know there's a lot of talk of Liverpool already possibly putting a bid in in January. Uh, Arsenal have been linked to him, lots of other clubs. Um, I think it's probably best for him if he stays in Italy. Uh, Maybe he does another season and then he maybe gets his his big move because obviously you want to see consistency and getting a lot of goals uh, over, over a consistent period of time. So it, it's really promising, and I really do think the sky's the limit for him. He's definitely, he's of the young strikers in Italy, he's probably uh, the best one. Uh, it's certainly Italian striker anyway, coming through. Yeah, no pressure there. And um, we did have one question which I'm going to take out of the onion bag because it's very relevant here. It comes from Emmanuel Davilia um, at at Emmanuel C. Davilia. Um, he wanted to, um, he, he asked what we thought of Belotti, which uh, genuinely, um, it, it was your timing was perfect, Emmanuel, because he was always scheduled to be tonight's Ipsos Choice, even before you asked the question. So uh, good timing, sir. But um, he also wanted to ask, um, as well as our thoughts on Belotti, do you think he would be right to leave Serie A or stay? like most Italians you've kind of just touched on it there but do you um I'll sort of change the question slightly do you see his future away from Torino or is is he at the right club for where he needs to be right now I think right now he's, he's fine where he is and uh if Torino keep uh sort of going in the direction they are then he's probably best to stay there because he has good players around him uh, Mihailovic is a coach who wants to, his team to score lots of goals uh, you can see the club's ambitious getting Joe Hart was a huge deal uh, that, that, that's massive for, for any club in Italy to be able to get an England international um, it, it's a really really big deal and the fact Torino pulled that off was very impressive um, so uh, you know do this season and maybe uh, and stay there again for another season um, yeah it's true obviously Italians don't tend to leave uh, the league um, but if he decides to stay in Syria, there's you know Juventus. Obviously, you can go and play for Napoli, Roma, uh, Milan, or Inter if either of them sort of get their act together. Uh, also, you know, really big clubs. Um, I'm not sure he's necessarily a, a Barca type player, um, but if he continues on this sort of trajectory and keeps improving, then there's no reason why, you know, at some point you wouldn't see him at a Real Madrid and just letting people cross the ball in for him and him knocking goals in all day long. I'm sure uh, the Madristas uh, w- would enjoy seeing that. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, I, I do think he's a good fit for the Milan clubs if if the option ever becomes available, particularly if uh, if Mr. Carney doesn't, doesn't behave himself in the future. So it'd be one to keep an eye on. But uh, there we go. There's another player inducted into the uh, into the Hipsters Hall of Fame, if you will, into the Hipsters' choice. And uh, as usual, if you do visit our website, you can find out all you need to know about uh, players. Even our very own Ross uh, went back and listened to episode two of our podcast all those months ago when we uh, covered Sofian and Buffet. Well, uh, all that time ago, of course, he's now a Southampton player. So uh, our Ross was right across our information. So there you go. We can be useful sometimes, John. It's always good, isn't it? So uh, that's another hipster's choice done and dusted. And as usual, again, if you have got somebody that you're desperate for us to talk about um, and you think he's relevant, then uh, drop us a line. And of course, our thanks to Kelly for compiling the information as usual. Uh, she's as busy as we are. So um, we thank her for taking her time out to get that information across. 
Right. We'll finish as we always do then, John, and uh, answer a couple of listeners' questions. And we'll finish with the onion bag. Okay, so just a couple of questions this week then. Um, We were inundated with loads and loads of questions last week, so I wanted to try and keep it a little bit lower key this week. So apologise if you didn't get your question dealt with, but we'll do our best this week. First one comes from Bobby Chakraborty, who um, is a very long-time listener. We appreciate it, Bobby. Um, He wanted to know, is Joe Hart being well-received at Torino? We all saw how well he was received when he first signed, but has the love continued? Because he seems to be quite a happy chap doesn't he yeah he he seems like himself at least he's definitely enjoying it um and the fans yeah they're really warm to him um there's uh, i think they've even got a little song for him now as well um i'm not sure of the exact translation to my italian is dreadful uh it's about as good as my english to be honest <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I don't know the exact words for it but yeah he's he's having a really good time there um he's one of the weird things actually he seems to have improved his distribution um, actually, since he's been there, which obviously was one of the big criticisms um, that Guardiola had and why he basically wasn't going to play. Um, I know it was, only, I say, only Palermo they were playing tonight, but, um, you know, even being 4-1 up, I saw him getting the ball and uh, spraying it out wide quickly to try and get another attack and get another goal. So he's really buying into the philosophy of the team there. And, yeah, he seems to be doing really well. So I- I'm... As much as I'm not an England fan uh, of the national team, I'm pleased to see an English player uh, go abroad, uh, in, in particular to Syria, and do really well. So uh, hopefully long may it continue. Yeah, yeah, it's fair play to him, as you say. He took the, took the gamble, and so far the gamble is, is paying off for him. So um, fair play. Uh, it's, not many people have, have been willing to do so. Um, our friend Simon Collings asked a couple of questions. Now, these are very Drew heavy, um, so uh, he must have not known Drew wasn't on tonight. So, Simon, uh, you might want to tweet Drew, but me and John will do our best. Um, he had three questions about, uh, about Germany. Um, he said, what's this about Tuchel being unhappy? And also, Aubameyang to Real Madrid finally um so two questions sorry not three so what do you make of of, of the talk that's coming out of germany that tuchel's been a bit cheesed off recently and the Aubameyang to real madrid I, mean, I think we can both cover that pretty quickly it will happen won't it it's just a question of when they fancy doing it because he's pretty much said he wants to play there one day it strikes me that this could be his last season at dortmund uh thoughts yeah uh, i think it's just a case of when real madrid pulled the trigger uh to be honest um if I, I think people uh, assume they have more money than they actually do to spend on players sometimes, um, and they just they just didn't have a space in the squad basically for him this season. So I think that's why he didn't get the move. Um, as for the Tuchel thing, um, it's the argument is apparently uh, again Drew would know more about this, but from what I've read, it's between himself and the uh, technical director who's been responsible for some of the amazing signings uh, that Dortmund have made, uh, Aubameyang being one, uh, K- uh, Kagawa, um, uh, and a few of the others, you know, getting them in very young or getting them in at an amazing price. Um, and uh, the board allegedly siding with the with the technical director more than Tuchel. Um, I don't know what the argument is exactly about, but apparently they don't like each other. And there was at one point rumours of an ultimatum that it's if one stays and the other has to go kind of thing um, that was coming from the Tuchel camp anyway, that's all quieted down a little bit now, so maybe it was just a bit of handbags and a bit of posturing um, I suppose it's one of those things you just sort of have to keep an eye on because Tuchel was obviously a manager whose stock has risen massively um, he was already well regarded before he went to Dortmund, obviously people knew about him because he'd uh, been working with Klopp at Mainz um, before so uh, there'd be plenty of clubs queuing up for him um, if if he did end up leaving Dortmund and equally as well I suppose the, the technical director there with the sort of players that he's managed to bring in um, I'm sure there'll be plenty of clubs who would uh, like to bring him on board yeah, yeah, I totally agree. He does uh, seem like a good fit for um, for many clubs, to be fair, and I think he'd be hot property if he ever did get out of Dortmund, assuming, of course, that Dortmund continue to perform as they are. Um, our final question this week, um, my goodness me, this is a loaded one, so um, good luck. But uh, it, I, I deliberately asked this when Tom wasn't on, because um, we knew that we knew what Tom was going to say. No, I'm only joking. But uh, Noma... Ma, man, uh, 
I, I've done it wrong again, Noma. I did this last night on the breakfast show. Uh, Mab, Mabandla. There we go. Got there in the end. Sorry, Noma. Um, she wanted to ask about Pep Guardiola's comments when he said that other teams, um, he said other leagues are as intense as the EPL or the Premier League, whichever you prefer. And she wants to ask, what is the best league? Uh, technically, tactically, competition, all of the above. So, do you, I mean, you follow Serie A, obviously, and, and I follow Liga. I think we're both kind of comfortable to admit that we don't, as much as we love our leagues, they're probably not the best two in the world um, on probably any of those. If we're completely honest, maybe Serie A is, is, has the best defenders um, in there and maybe Liga has some of the best young players. But as an overall package, I mean... I, I suppose, do we both agree technically the Spanish league is, is the best as far as that ability side of things goes? Tactically, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think La Liga has probably the longest list of the, the best technical players. Um, it's not always going to be the quickest paced games. Uh, sometimes there are, you know, sometimes, you know, you don't expect uh, Atletico Madrid to score as many goals as they do, but they've got the ability to do it. It's just uh, Simeone is a bit more of a reserve manager. It's not his style, but there's no doubting the technical quality in that league is fantastic. Um, you know, there, there's players uh, in particular, so many midfielders that are at clubs that are lower, really low down the league there, that Premier League clubs would love to be able to, you know, have in their team just for their ability on the ball, but it depends whether they fits with their style. Um I think the, the genuine excitement of the Premier League is from more from the fans and the noise uh, and the atmosphere, and that's the big selling point of it. And I think that's what really sells the league, uh, particular, particularly uh, in America and uh, in Asia, um, where they're perhaps not so used to the culture of football and uh, and that kind of fan atmosphere. Um, at, at a sporting event and the rivalry and everything else. Obviously in America they do have that with other sports but um, you don't see that same or you don't at least hear that same kind of intensity in other leagues uh, particularly in Serie A as well where the crowd attendance is terrible. Um, I'd be selfish and say that tactically Serie A is probably the best league just because I think you have to be able to play so many different styles in Italy and know how to drill a defence in such a way uh, in so many different uh, ways to adapt to the teams because not all the teams do play very different systems in in Italy. It's not just everyone plays three five two. That is really not the case at all. And you saw that with uh, Spalletti, um, you know, playing that sort of three and a half man defence, sort of floating defender uh, in the game against Napoli. Um, and like you said, yeah, France has amazing, uh, amazing young players, um, and obviously topped off with the talent they've got at PSG. Bundesliga is probably the one I would say that's in terms of intensity is probably the closest. Because it's yeah, so fast-paced. Because mm. the teams there, and I think it's part in part due to the 18 teams in the league. Um, so there really isn't a nothing game on the line. You're always competing for something, whether it's to stay in the league or for Europe or or pushing for the title or Europa League spot. There's every game means something. Whereas I think when you have a 20-team league, there are games where well, it's not really. You know, we're we're a 14th to maybe if we're lucky ninth place team. Um, this one doesn't really matter, we can throw this one away kind of thing. Um, not necessarily the attitude you want to hear, but it, it's, I think it's the reality of, of some leagues and how it goes. So, um, And they just don't, they don't like nil-nils in Germany. <laughs> no, no, they really don't, no. no <laughs> they, they absolutely hate them. So, or indeed I, draws. Yeah, um, <laughs> so I, I just think it's, um, it, honestly, it comes down to your personal preference of what style of football you like um, you know if you want really fast paced action where you're going to see goals and um, and t- both teams really going for it then Bundesliga is probably the best one to watch if you want to watch really skillful technical players who are amazing on the ball then Spain's probably the best the atmosphere is great for the Premier League for the most games I don't think it's true of all the games you know if you're watching uh, West Brom Sunderland the atmosphere might be great but the actual football on the pitch probably isn't going to be the best um, France is amazing talent to watch and Italy if you really like defending come and watch it <laughs> <laughs> and tactical players and also managers uh, often losing their rag and shouting a lot and throwing their shirts and things like that that's that's always good fun but yeah I, I do think it's one of those pre- personal preferences but yeah I would I would give it to Tom on the La Liga probably overall being the best league just because yeah. just because of the technical ability of the players 
Yeah, fair point, fair point. Uh, what we're essentially saying, uh, listeners, is if you um, if you want to experience all the best from one league, you have to watch five leagues. That, that's essentially <laughs> what we're saying. Um, so, you know, just, just get a grip and start watching football wall-to-wall 24-7 like we do. And we haven't no, even talk, uh, touched on the Eredivisie and MLS. Oh, absolutely. And, Portuguese, yeah, so yeah leagues, Liga Mosh, yeah. yeah. The Turkish League, I know, is quite a popular one for a lot of people. Mm. Um, you know, there are a lot of upper... I mean, even leagues that are sort of slowly building, like the Russian League, I yeah. think, is, is slowly starting to become quite a thing. They all offer thing. sort Belgium. of individual things, don't they, that not necessarily mm. every league can give you. No, absolutely. And, and of course, again, the rise of MLS in, mm. in the United States. Um, I know a lot of people are fans of Argentine football. I've got to be honest, I'm not sure why, because it, it's, it's pretty bad. Um, <laughs> every time I've watched Amazing it... Amazing um, goals and terrible goalkeepers. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. And, and not to mention the Brazilian league, which you'd think would be full of goals, but is often a lot tighter than, than most European games. So one thing I would say, and we'll, we'll, we'll close off with this thought, um, if, you, if you are an insomniac, if you work nights, um, sadly, I have a, a, a proper job in the real world these days, so I can't watch as much football at night as I used to. But I remember a couple of years ago um, really enjoying the, the uh, copper um uh what's it called the um i was gonna say copper america then not the sud america the uh oh, goodness me i forgot the bloody name of it i watched it so much the south copper american, Libertadores. yeah the south american the champions league basically. south american <laughs> champions league yeah the uh the copper Libertadores is a really really fun tournament and obviously it's it generally I, th- I believe it starts in january it's normally sort of a winter over here kind of thing um tournament but there's there's a lot of games late at night and you get some really good games because you get teams like a i don't know a sao paulo playing the colombian champions or uh you know an emelec against uh fluminense or it's really really good fun to see teams com- from completely different backgrounds playing off in, in games so that's always good to watch um and always fun and uh yeah I, i'd highly recommend taking in a little bit of south american football if you if you like a little bit of late night football or, or if you uh could afford premier sports which i think show it live so there you go there's a little plug for you um right okay we'll um, we'll leave it there then john um We've kind of been sort of a, a two and a half man show tonight. Um, and hopefully next week we'll be back to our full complement, as I say, with Drew returning. Uh, just a quick plug for the Satchel podcast. Um, yourself and myself will be back on Thursday, John. Yeah. Um, restoring our our uh, podcast um, marriage, as it were. <laughs> um, and we'll, we're hoping to be joined by Ross, barring any um, barring any issues of like, computers blowing up or anything like that uh ross will be joining us to talk into southampton which i warn you in advance listeners that will be quite heavily featured um but we'll also discuss all the champions league action some big games this week isn't there barcelona man city yeah um uh we've got um juventus leon i think that'll be quite a tasty game we've got um, arsenal ludiger okay maybe not that one um <laughs> <laughs> but there's some quite big games this week um psg basel might be fairly decent as well leverkusen uh, um, spurs as well leverkusen really, really spurs, good opportunity for spurs uh, with the former yeah. leverkusen are in so absolutely um and of course your winter gladback side uh trip uh, take a trip to scotland yes like, um so zero well. points so far um <laughs> Yeah, good times. Good times. Uh, they'll be hoping they can turn that around. But yeah, it should be uh, it should be a good week of, of uh, European football, and um, and of course, there's a full championship program as well, uh, which Ross will be across when we uh, get to the end of the weekend and we do another English breakfast show. So, plenty to get your teeth into. Um, you can find us. I stole football rambles saying last night, John. How bad was that? So I'm going to have to come it's up fine. with my. I know. I have to come up with my own little slogan. But if you want to find all of our um, all of our bits and bobs that we do, you can find us on SoundCloud, on iTunes, uh, and on YouTube, and I think it's Stitcher and all the relevant podcast apps. You can find us all over the place. But if you do like us and you're a new listener, uh, drop us a tweet, and we'll um, we'll give you a little shout out. For example, I'm going to shout out a gentleman by the name of Oscar this week, um, who tweeted me um, asking me to uh, to drop him a DM. Um, he uh, he sent me a message this afternoon. Um, he's interested in having a chat with us at some point. Um, he's uh, he's from the UK, 
and he usually follows the Spanish league. So him and Tom will get on well. Uh, he also follows the Premier League and he said it would be his first experience of podcast, but he's done some amateur work when he was at college and he used to do a school podcast. And he said he's been uh, watching a lot of Bayern Munich and Napoli this season. So School he, podcast? Podcast yeah, didn't even exist when I was at school. <laughs> isn't it, I know, isn't it? It's one of the times I thought the exact same thing. So, uh, so yeah, we'll be getting in touch with Oscar and um, seeing if we can have a chat with him at some point. So uh, there you go. There's another person who, um, who could make an appearance for an interview in the future. Um, and, of course, we will be doing some more interviews in the future anyway with uh, relevant guests when they pop up. So um, there we go. Right. OK, we will leave it there, John. Uh, we've covered plenty this week, even though there's uh, only been only been uh, Well, technically the three of us. So uh, thank you very much for your time. I will speak to you on Thursday. Yes, indeed. Good stuff. Well, thank you very much for everyone for listening. Um, as we always say on this podcast, keep your beard strong and your glasses trendy. Keep those questions coming in. Keep the feedback coming in. Drop us a line if you like what we do. And uh, most importantly of all, until the satchel on Thursday, enjoy your football. Thank mm-hmm. you.